Okay, everybody, welcome back to another edition of the Orthodox Nationalist. Uh, today is um, the uh, month of August, August 19th, 2011. And what we're going to talk about is something that I've been asked to deal with uh, numerous times, and I keep forgetting about it, but we're going to deal with it now. And that is the basic anti-nationalist position that you find amongst academics and liberals in general, and uh, refute it. As I've said, and I've written many times before, the academic establishment proves its corruption and manipulation when it deals with this issue in particular. The arguments against nationalism, and when I refer to this, by the way, I should make it clear that I'm talking about either an ethnic or religious cultural tradition that then in some way can be mobilized for the sake of sovereignty, of independence, uh, mobilizing a population for warfare. Uh, I am not referring to the state. And this is, is one of the problems in academic treatments on this topic, is that they're always referring to a state that allegedly has an interest in making certain that its population is homogenous. What the academics don't grasp is that states, governments, have an interest in having the population as divided as possible, not as united as possible. And this is because state policy has a tendency to really thrive when it comes to manipulating ethnic sentiment against other groups in the society that are causing the government problems. Playing one ethnic group off against another is normal state policy and has been state policy at least since the Persian Empire if not prior to that. So when I'm referring to the concept of nationalism, I'm referring to an ethnic and religious community that stretches back a certain time in history, and that community, like any individual, develops a sense of itself because of its experiences, and these experiences have a tendency to revolve around self-protection, against those surrounding groups that are hostile to it. And I've defined the concept of ethnic and or religious nationalism as that political point of view that takes as its central markers those elements in its identity that have served to protect it or to see it through many significant psychological shocks. And these shocks have a tendency to include things like colonial rule, slavery, genocide, and attacks on its history. The fact is, is that states historically have sought to destroy nations because nations can serve as a basis for rebellion. States involved in colonial empires profiting from colonial empires, have done everything in their power to denationalize those that it controls. This was the case in the British Empire relative to the Gales, especially under Elizabeth I, the Russian Empire relative to uh, the Ukrainians. This is a normal approach that states often use to control subject ethnic groups either on the one hand supporting their national aspirations as a way to use them against its opponents, or denying their national aspirations so as to defang any real development of rebellion. So, for example, in the Austrian Empire, who really brought this kind of ethnic manipulation to an art form, supported Ukrainian Catholic culture, this so-called Uniate culture, to be used against the Poles. 
they sought to denationalize the Poles by renationalizing the Ukrainians. They did the same thing concerning Hungary. The attempt, especially in, in the later empire, to denationalize Hungary was partially accomplished by renationalizing the Croats. So the point is that they used these kinds of ethnic sentiments for the sake of supporting their uh, empire-wide goals. In the United States, generally speaking, white ethnicities, Irish or Russian, are um, de-emphasized because the regime has always known that these kind of ethnic forms of solidarity and cohesion can serve as an extremely violent way to rebel against a corrupt system. The regime, whether it be the, the big banks, the corporations and media and government, however, have sought to promote things like certain aspects of black nationalism or Jewish nationalism or Hispanic nationalism for the sake of mobilizing them and then using and manipulating them against their poor, middle-class, white opponents. So, that we have to re remember that in terms of government policy and in terms of regime policy in general, which is far larger than the state, nationalism is a political tool. It's something to be used and manipulated, not for its own ends necessarily, in the sense that it's trying to create a homogenous population, but rather that they use it for the sake of manipulating social life, using one group against another. So when you read the very, very bad literature on nationalism, uh, almost without exception, written by political liberals and Marxists who are already biased against the phenomenon, Um, they will denigrate one group of people, such as, say, uh, Irish Americans or Italian Americans, and yet praise to the skies the national aspirations of those with whom they generally agree, such as the Jews. So, usually what you're dealing with is blatant intellectual dishonesty, because while they're denying nationalism in general, they seek to use it and promote it politically amongst those groups of people with which they agree. So the whole thing is a fraud and a lie based on a foundation of sand, which in turn is based on a whole lot of foundation money. We know from analyzing the speeches of the institutions like Bilderberg or Trilateral, the elite groups that seek to join not just governments, but corporate and banking elites, as well as media and university elites, primarily, over the last 20 years or so, maybe more, their number one enemy has always been nationalism. Independent ethnic groups, independent religious groups, independent governments seeking to finance their own development rather than going to the elites for money. It should be noted that in Europe, nationalist leaders are either killed or sent to prison, while communists and socialists are normally given foundation grants to continue their research. So, so far we're talking about two different methods of understanding nationalism. First of all, we have to define it very clearly. We're talking about a general will in Rousseau's sense of the term general will can't come into existence unless there is a basic ethnic solidarity and that solidarity in turn based on tradition, based on their common suffering. It is an extended family. Families have a tendency to come together when going when the going gets difficult. And the same thing for nations. Nations in the ethnic or religious sense are brought together and made stronger in many cases through occupation and persecution. Because ultimately what happens is that the national group begins to defend itself as this uh, resistance organization 
with solidarity and tradition, maintaining the customs against foreign occupation. This was the case in Serbia uh, against the Turkish occupation, where the uh, Zadruga, uh, the father of the family, the Slava celebration, uh, the tradition of the Orthodox Church, all of this was synthesized into a single ethnic tradition that was used under the pain of colonial occupation for the sake of continuing the line of this identity. In Ireland, the exact same thing. Many of the older traditions, whether it be of the church or of their own self-understanding, are used to protect themselves against the endless attacks on it from the British Empire. So they held even more firmly to the older um, Catholic system versus the uh, always changing uh, Protestant and or Anglican system that was imposed on them from Britain. So this body of custom and tradition is a sense of self-identification that serves as the very foundation, the general will of this particular group. States in general have very little patience for this. They do not seek any kind of unity that it itself cannot control. Nevertheless, ethnic groups have existed as long as humanity has existed. In the Middle Ages, Irish and Scottish ethnic tradition was extremely well developed, was argued for against all kinds of, of, of invasions and colonial occupations. This was the case also in Poland, in Sweden, in the Balkans, and certainly in the Orthodox countries of Eastern Europe. It was a highly religious, highly social sense of self-identification, functioning no different than any individual. We ourselves develop a sense of ourselves through our experience and through our education. It's no different for us as individuals than it is for societies. And we're not talking about states, governments. For the most part, when you talk about nationalism, we're talking about ethnic groups that... Um, are under the control of other states. So, um, from here on, I want to make eight specific points. Now, these specific points are normally the arguments used against nationalism by the academic elite. Book after book after book after book is published attacking those forms of nationalism that are in opposition to the regime, which is clearly the case in places like Serbia or Russia, but there's an equal number of books and papers being published backing the ethnic tradition of those with which the system agrees. And that would be the case in, in at least parts of black America, Hispanic America, and um and the Jews worldwide. So the attacks on nationalism are dishonest because um, the system will use this kind of national identification when it serves its interest. And remember too that we're talking about Rousseau's general will. We're talking about a group of people that despite their distinctions have a strong sense of attachment to their culture as a whole. And of course, this is you know, the most ancient connection of human beings to the social whole. The entire Old Testament is about how one group of people is constantly falling away from its cultural whole. And then there are these, Protest uh, these um, prophets and poets that seek to bring them back to that Tradition. And this is the case no matter where you go in the ancient world. Plato himself spoke of the glories of the Greek peoples, the Greek nationality, as against those outside of it who he considered to be barbarians. This was a normal understanding. The Ethiopians had the exact same thing. They viewed themselves as a specific Christian ethnic group, completely surrounded by Islam, and cut off from the west of the world by, by Islam, 
And what developed is an extremely tight sense of ethnic solidarity under the monarchy. This is as ancient as, uh, as, as you could possibly imagine or study. The identification of the group functions in the same way as our own personal identification, and it also has the same problems. And what I want to say here is that when you hear these attacks on nationalism, and I have eight in particular. There's probably more, but, but there's eight big ones that come up again and again and again. Those problems that they want to point out in terms of ethnic identity can very easily be applied to our own personal identity. And so a lot of these um, arguments against nationalism, in the way that I've defined the word as generally non-statist, Um, are in general self-refuting because they could be easily used against any form of identification. And so when you read this stuff, and I've been through so much of it, it's almost absurd, you realize that if their point of view was to be consistently promoted and followed, you would have a group of completely alienated, schizophrenic, mentally sick individuals with no identity whatsoever, but there would be pockets of regime-supported nationalists, uh, Jews and Hispanics in America or, or whatever it, it is. They are encouraged to pursue their specific national and ethnic or racial uh, culture and customs. So again, it's a completely fraudulent approach to social life, which in turn is based on intellectual dishonesty, but maintains itself because this is the sort of thing that the big foundations like Rockefeller or uh, General Electric or Ford or Soros has been promoting for a very long period of time. The first and most common argument used against nationalism is that it creates a culture that did not ever, in fact, exist. And so what they posit is a little ironic, because what they're positing here is that somehow a group of elites invented a concept of tradition that they then somehow used to enforce and impose a political order on a population. That's really one of the worst arguments against nationalism, but it's very, very common. The ironic part is that that is precisely what the academic establishment is doing to the people who they are preaching to and teaching to. If anything, liberalism was something that was violently imposed upon people through the growth of capitalism, the growth of the state, the destruction of the traditional order, the traditional agrarian family. Uh, liberalism and capitalism were violently imposed throughout the world, and there is almost no exceptions to that because it took violent revolutions. In 20th century Russia, or in late 18th century France, or in 17th century Britain, to impose that on a population. If anything, the most common form of government is an ethnic monarchy, what we might call a, a tribal monarchy. That's very much the germ of what later develops into this extended family of the ethnic or religious organization. Again, we're not talking about the state here. When we look at the great nationalist leaders of Ukraine, for example, or Ireland, we notice that they do construct a uh, national sense out of the ancient records of their population. Normally what they did was they went through the great poets and stories and traditions and political history of their people and built a sense of self upon uh, a population that had been denationalized through foreign occupation. You need to remember there is a sleight of hand in this very stupid argument that the tradition isn't true and it's all made up and all this crap and this conspiracy of intellectuals and government officials simply impose this on people. It's such a bad argument 
Um, but, but it has a hidden purpose. And the hidden purpose is that, uh, it justifies denationalization and therefore empowers the state and the economic elites to impose their vision of reality onto the denationalized population. So the whole thing is self-contradictory, and it shows what a fraud it all is. If you denationalize a population by saying that everything they believe is nonsense, what that means in reality is that then the state and the economic system can now impose whatever they want onto a population. Now, some may say that this is a problem because you know, we are talking about taking from ancient sources and writing and, and really kind of building a strong sense of who a people are. Well, doesn't that suggest that um, uh, the these stories are, in fact, constructions? Now, of course, that begs the question, because the big question is, why did these people feel the need to reconstruct? It's a simple matter of doing history. Drahmanov or Shevchenko, for example, in Ukraine, uh, Patrick Pierce in Ireland. It, it's really the same process. They simply did their homework. They did research into whatever they could come across. And in Ukraine in particular, they went to the peasantry. They wrote down all the folk songs. They went. They wrote down all of the old traditions, how they prayed, how they treated the sick, how they ate. This wasn't an invention. They merely went and gathered the information. Not how people should live, but how they in fact do live. Because if you're studying Ukraine or Ireland, you're talking about a group of people who have been occupied by a foreign power, have been explicitly, I mean, as a matter of policy, denationalized. And therefore, it's a moral imperative to go figure out what it was that frightened the system to such an extent that they needed to remove it and destroy it. The fact is that nationalism is a weapon against the regime, and the regime knows it, and therefore no different than the British Empire, our current intellectual fakes seek to do everything in their power to denationalize those, because the fact is nationalism and ethnic belonging and solidarity uh, is, is a very common and powerful way to revolt against illegitimate power. But my normal answer when someone says, oh, this stuff is all, all just invented and constructed, I mean, even if you know, the bulk of this history is in fact true and these guys have, have done their research and everything else, it's still a construction. And the answer is very simple. You say, but you have done that relative to your individuality. You mean to tell me there was never a time where you sat down and took stock of yourself? There was never a time, usually when, you know, something terrible happened, you, you uh, uh, I don't know, somebody died or you lost a job or your marriage fell apart or something like that. Usually what a smart person will do is sit down and go through their history, go through their sufferings, go through what has helped and hurt them over the years and begin uh, building a sense of self, building a sense of who I am and what I'm doing. Almost anybody that is scrupulous and reflective does that. Why can't families do that? Why can't ethnic groups do that? It seems a perfectly natural and normal way to build integrity. That integrity can be mental, it can be familial, it can be political, it can be economic, it can be ethnic. It's the exact same process, but it's simply... Uh, over a larger and larger area and group of people. So I simply don't see the problem. To claim that the tradition is invented is ridiculous because usually what these people do, uh, especially in, in smaller countries, is to figure out how the people are living. That's, that's their point. And recording the folk songs and everything else and building an ethic around that. But that's no different than what an individual will do. When coming across a terrible situation, we sit down and we take stock of ourselves. There's no difference between doing that and building a strong sense of self based on historical suffering. That is a perfectly normal and natural way to proceed. 
and there's always going to be problems, no different than your own individual sense of self, than in a national sense of self. There's always going to be contradictions, there's always going to be problems, but any good patriot, our job is to try to work through them, try to find more information, try to find uh, a, a, a greater and higher sense of truth that can reconcile these problems. We do that relative to our individual identity, nationalist writers and speakers and activists do that relative to the ethnic identity. There is no problem. This is simply how human beings have been constructed. So uh, we're going to take a break now, and when we come back, we'll finish up this uh, talk on, on nationalism, and we have seven more points to deal with uh, before we finish. So we'll be right back. Hang in there. Okay, welcome back to the Orthodox Nationalist. Uh, what we're doing today is we're refuting the arguments used against the nationalist political point of view. And these are essentially eight arguments that I have culled from many years of reading the academic establishment uh, on uh, nationalism. There are a handful of writers like Van Evra or uh, Anthony Smith that are also very suspicious of the academic establishment's take on um, a lot of the more ridiculous arguments used by historians and political scientists against nationalism. Anthony Smith, forever, uh, for example, uh, he, he's, he, his main argument is that, you know, if you go around claiming that it's all mythical and people made it up for the sake of controlling people, then how do you explain how it is that people around the globe are willing to die for this tradition, are willing to fight for this tradition, are, are rebelling against governments and elites all over the world on the basis of this tradition. And how is it that these people, who you apparently think are so stupid that they'll believe anything, how is it that they were so brainwashed? Because most of these ethnic customs existed long before there was any kind of public school system. Not to mention the simple fact that you guys are doing the same thing that you're accusing everybody else of. And this is very common in academia. Usually, when the academic elite make these wild accusations, it's usually really about themselves because there is no place in history where sheer downright brainwashing is the order of the day more than in the academic classroom. The point is that denationalization is about the regime's control over people. The second argument, very common, and you've all heard this at one point or another, that warfare and intolerance derive from nationalism. And it's another one of the more stupid arguments, because generally speaking, wars are over economic issues. Wars derive from empires, not from nations. Empires and capitalist expansion, these have largely been, in recent times, the causes of war. It has been empires who have committed most of the genocides in the world. An empire is multinational by definition. And the rebellion against empire has normally been based on ethnicity. It's a stupid argument, really, because there is no particular point of view, whether you're a Marxist or a socialist or an individualist or a liberal, that can't be used to justify warfare. The Soviet Union was based exclusively on an anti-national uh, economic set of concepts that, in, in theory, but never in practice, were based on some form of equality. It's a stupid argument. It's used by academics because it sounds good, and there's no one in academia really that's going to challenge them on it, and so they become very intellectually lazy. The third is industry. Now, I got a letter from an idiot, this is a long time ago, claiming that nationalism could only really exist in a highly industrialized economy with a great degree of literacy, and the newspapers and the educational system brainwash the population. Then, of course, you remind them that the ethnic tradition and even the most strong 
um, ethnic traditionalists have a tendency to come from non-industrial countries. That was the case in Ireland, in Ukraine, in Serbia, 18th century Japan. It was kind of, you know, industry is completely denationalizing because it uh, seeks to expand itself, markets in other countries, and what you get from this largely is some form of globalism. Capitalism and industry are international things, not national things. And, you know, again, this is a very bad argument, largely because it still rests on this idea that, um, with the exception of this small group of, of, of elites, everyone else is just an idiot and, and, and will accept anything that they're given. Um, now, despite all the problems with that assumption, um, if you actually know anything about industrial societies, you realize that the media and public school system was very diverse in how they approached the national question. Many were globalists, many were individualists, some were nationalists, some were more conservative in the royal and aristocratic sense of the word. There was no single monolithic entity that was imposing their will on people. Even, even in Prussia, which probably came the closest to that, there were many different approaches, some more capitalist, some more ethnic, some more empire-building, some more royalist. And to think that there's this, you know, thing that, that can just brainwash people, it just really, it, it really should show you what's happening in academia, that these arguments are, are taken seriously. Um, the fourth... Um, the, the fourth argument is that nationalism is historically specific. That is to say that you can't separate nationalism from the state and the early 19th century and the French Revolution. These are the things that push nationalism in the forefront. Now, it's true that that's probably one of the better arguments, although I'm not sure it's against nationalism as such. Generally speaking, what they're referring to is this concept of the nation state, which, by the way, is a complete myth. Generally speaking, there is no such thing as a nation state. There is a state that uses certain aspects of the nation for their own purposes. We're defining nationalism here as a cultural phenomenon. It's a totally separate argument to say what are those variables that takes the cultural tradition and the religious tradition and turns it into a political movement. Those are two totally separate things. We're talking about how people live their lives, you know, language and religion and tradition and experience. They may or may not become political ideologies. I really don't care. We're talking about living a rational life based on solidarity and tradition and virtue embedded in those things. It's this constant separation. Or really, you know, it's a sleight of hand. When you read some of these people, Hobsbawm and many others, you'll see that they go from state to nation to ethnicity to religion, and they go back and forth, and it's kind of hard to tell what they're talking about at any given time because they can't separate the development of the modern state, which has imposed itself on the ethnic and religious tradition, in many cases, actually almost in all cases, on numerous and multiple already existing ethnic traditions. And, of course, the other problem is what is it that these people are using and manipulating? They already posit, by the very argument, the existence of previously existing ethnic cultures and traditions. And yes, it's true that it's very hard to write them all down in some kind of cohesive way. The ethnic tradition is always very fluid, no different than our own individualism, no different than our own sense of self. It's always undergoing change. It's always coming up against problems. That's not a problem. That's not an argument against it. It's simply how people are. It's a better argument, but still, generally speaking, a bad one. And the fifth, as I've really been talking about already, is the concept of the state. The idea is that there is no ethnicity without the state because the state imposes itself on an ethnic group and then kind of regurgitates that ethnic material on the base, and it becomes a state ideology. Uh, again, it's question begging because we want to know what is it that they're taking and where did it come from? The state can serve as a protective coding of an ethnic group. In some cases, this is the only way that state, that, that ethnic groups have been able to protect themselves. 
Normally, of course, the state uh, is, is an empire, and the empire um, has many different ethnic groups under its control. And really, the only just thing for the state to do is to either separate into its various ethnic components or have some kind of proportional representation where these ethnic organizations can debate and air their grievances. But the most specific thing is that the, these ethnic groups live their own lives in whatever political or economic arrangement happens to exist. The interest of the state is never to create a homogenous population. It's to create a divided population. This is the history of empires. This is the history of, of the United States. This is the history of the British Empire, of, of France, of the, you know, whatever empire you're looking at, it's about using one group against another. Argument number six is that these ethnic traditions have been selectively used over time for the sake of creating this state ideology. It's kind of a stupid argument because there isn't a political movement in existence that doesn't do something like that. Every political and economic movement selectively uses history for its own purposes. The academics and the liberals are no different than anybody else. The big difference is, is that ethnicities have a tendency to grow organically while liberalism has to be violently imposed on a population. Not to mention the simple fact that that's how we as individuals come to understand ourselves. We're always using the most salient aspects of our personal histories when we sit down and take stock of ourselves. We all do this. I don't know why nations can't do this. There's no one more self-glorifying than the academic sitting in his office making $300,000 a year for a few hours' work. The scientific establishment has completely distorted their history for the sake of justifying their power. This goes on, you know, it's, it's a constant thing. But to claim, therefore, that it's a problem with nationalism would automatically entail that it's a problem with every political or social group. The simple fact is is that the ethnic community as it develops over time will use the most salient aspects of its history in its constantly developing sense of self. I don't see how that's a problem because I do that with my own self uh, identity. You do that with your own self identity. I don't see a problem. That's part of, you know, living a human life. That's part of um, uh, developing a, a more and more rational sense of self. So it's a stupid argument. The seventh concept is that it is, as I it's kind of said this before, that it's a top-down operation. But the problem is, is that I concede willingly that the state uses aspects of the ethnic tradition for the sake of control. That in no manner harms the ethnic group as such, it simply shows and proves that the state is more often than not completely alien from its captive ethnic populations. Uh, this is, this is a, a daily, daily thing. The ethnic tradition and religious tradition developed independently and often in opposition to the various states and empires that have tried to control it. So the, the issue is that when you separate the state as this bureaucratic set of offices and, and coercive services and stuff like that from the actual self-identity and language and tradition of a specific ethnic group, you're dealing with apples and oranges. Now, I, I should note that um, when Hegel and Herder and others use the word state, which is very similar in German as it is in English, as you all know, they weren't just referring to the coercive life of the state bureaucracy, police and tax police and armies and presidents and pages and interns and all this crap. No. In, in Hegel's philosophy of right, he uses the word state as a synthesis of all the cultural and economic history of a specific group of people. He's not just talking about the state the way we moderns talk about the state. 
for Hegel and Herder, even Fichte, so many others, the state wasn't just these offices and these bureaucrats. It was an entire culture that can only incompletely be manifest in any particular formal body, like an army or a state or whatever. And they use different symbols, but, you know, these symbols are... Um, are very, very deep. I mean, they go deep into history, and they speak volumes. Now, generally speaking, the, the anti-nationalist is a nominalist. That is to say that uh, they believe that only individuals exist, and those individuals that I pick out of this wide range of things that I experience are only those things that have a political or social salience. So, for example they will say that only the individual human being exists and therefore, because there is no intrinsic connection among individuals, the nation must be, by virtue of that, made up. So, of course, they beg the question because they're assuming what they're trying to argue. But by that argument, if you, as someone who's trying to learn about a particular topic, goes back and forth on something important, or even, even you know, is, is worried about your own identity as a person and is changing back and forth and is worried about their job and their sense of self and what they're here for, well, you're not an individual anymore. You might be a half dozen individuals. The fact is, is that we're talking about your mind changing and, and, and altering itself on many, many, many important topics of interest to you and we might look at you and say, well, that's very, very unhealthy. You have no sense of who you are. But that's classic nominalism. What we really want is our mind to be basically integral as to what we do, who we are, why we're here, to avoid this kind of modern nominalist problem that it's all ridiculous, it's all absurd. No, human beings are born and raised within a web of identity. That's been the case since there have been human beings. It is completely artificial to impose this individual straitjacket on people. We're born helpless. We're not born free. We're born completely helpless. We need a family and a nation and a people and a village and a city and a society to create these institutions so that we can grow up virtuous, intelligent people. The individual is a complete abstraction, no different than the state is. So these guys who are attacking nationalism are doing little more than serving the system as a whole that would love to see these completely deculturalized, denationalized, rationated people that have no connection one with another and therefore cannot rebel. They're mentally ill people with no purpose. But this ultimately is what the regime wants and what they've been promoting over and over again. In, in our particular area, in their treatment of nationalism and their treatment of the ethnic tradition. And finally, um, the argument that this ethnic identity is always changing and always evolving, therefore it must be false. Uh, and of course, it's a stupid argument because I could say to them that... Um, that your individuality from being a little kid to being a teenager in your 20s, 30s, 40s, that's changed, and therefore you're not really an individual. You know, the academics, they're all identical in their political point of view. They're all basically leftists of one kind or another. And so they know that the more myth that they create about their enemies, and, you know, they could get almost as outrageous as they want in inventing things, knowing that there's really no serious opposition and there's certainly no diversity within their own ranks. And I think what happens is that they get very, very soft. And because they get very, very soft, you know, they really don't argue very much anymore. What they really care about is tenure and not having to teach very much and increasing their salaries and everything else and doing the minimal amount of work possible. So what I've given you here are the eight basic arguments that come up again and again, and because of the conformism of academia, they are never challenged. But because academia is a closed guild, a closed class 
that controls information and controls teaching at the university, they don't have to worry about these arguments because they got rid of me and they got rid of people like me. Anthony Smith is is a is an exception to that, and and uh, but he's very very careful in what he says. The fact is, is that nothing makes any sense about the ethnic position, because the ethnic group and its development, and its religious point of view and language and everything else, acts really no different, no differently than our own individual sense of self. It grows, it develops. It results from suffering and obstacles. We pick and choose the salient aspects of our experience and building our self-worth and and sense of identity. Well, nations do the same thing. States, of course, try to impose themselves on an already existing and fluid ethnic situation and use it for their own purposes. But that's not an argument against nationalism. It's the argument against the state. you got to drop this mythical uh, absurdity of the nation-state which has never existed and never will exist, and understand the state only in utilitarian terms. Or, alternatively, use the word state in the way that Hegel used the word state, and then we may make more sense out of it. Anyway, um, that's my show for tonight. I appreciate you guys uh, listening to me. Uh, Any questions on this or other topics that we have covered, uh, please email me, and I usually get back to you as quickly as possible, unless you're an idiot, and I'll ignore you altogether. All right. Good night, everybody. God bless.